Okay, so let's go through the objectives of this lecture. So the objectives are to, for those doctors in the audience, and we hope that there are a few, to introduce marine life toxinology as a core competence in diving medicine, to recognize potentially hazardous creatures most commonly encountered by divers in general, to understand the principles of sound field treatment versus folklore, and to understand the different mechanisms of injury as a way to rationalize preventive measures. So for those of you that came to this lecture to see some blood, I'm sorry to disappoint you. This is as, as much blood as you're going to see. We're not gonna be talking about you know, sharks and things that could eventually uh, bleed you to death because there's nothing specific about those animals that is more the realm of, of trauma. Yes, I mean, very serious injuries, but they don't have anything in particular that we need to be careful about other than avoiding them. So we're gonna be talking about uh, marine life in general and those that have some toxic aspects that are worth mentioning. So this is one way we can organize toxic marine life. We have them as vertebrates and invertebrates. Among the vertebrates, we're gonna be talking about some fish. There are many fish in the ocean that can cause puncture wounds and they can hurt, but not all of them have a specific toxin. And among those that have a specific toxin, the ones that, that are more commonly encountered by divers are this, this species we see here. Then we're gonna be talking about stingrays and sea snakes. And that's as much as we're gonna go with vertebrates. With invertebrates, we're gonna be talking about cnidarians, which are the jellyfish, some corals, and some hydroids. Uh, we're gonna be talking about bristle worms, some mollusks, and finally, echinoderms. So let's jump right in with fish. So what you see here, these are the scorpeniform, the order of the scorpeniform. So what you see here on this, between these three animals, we have to make a differentiation between these two groups of fish. Let's put what we see on the left, let's call those the flamboyant species. They do want to be seen and they want to scare you with their appearance. And what we see on the right, let's call those the mimetic species. They have absolutely no intention on being seen. They both belong to the same family. They have similar features. But it's important to recognize that it's particularly the ones that we see on the right, the mimetic species, the ones that tend to cause the most serious incidents. Now, there are species of scorpeniforms in all oceans, even in the Arctic and the Antarctic. They are all voracious predators. They eat fish, usually at night. And it's the extravagance on the ones and the mimicry on the other ones what makes them highly dangerous. On the flamboyant species, they have absolutely no fear of, of predators because most, in most places they don't have any, so they won't move until you actually swim over them. And the mimetic species, they are so sure that you won't see them that they won't move either. So it's when you put your hands on the reef or when you step on the reef or you walk on a beach with a, with a rocky bottom where you actually step on them. They're not aggressive, they, they, they never attack people. And most of the incidents with the, with the lionfish, they happen when people are you know, hunting them and then manipulating them. And that's eventually when they get the puncture wounds. So what we see on this slide here, this is a picture of the dorsal fin of, um, or peniform. And if you see the structure here, semi-transparent, that's where the venom is accumulated or stored. Now, when we look into the spine, what you see here on this animation, so we see the spine, which is like a very dense cartilage, and we see two grooves on each side, and then eventually those grooves, they connect with this sac where we have all the venom. It is important to emphasize that they don't have any active mechanism of injecting venom. When the spine gets embedded in your skin, that's when eventually we squeeze our tissues, they squeeze the gland, and the venom gets injected. Not all spines have these structures, sorry, not all fins have these structures, but some of them do, and you can see those where. Now, regarding the venom itself, uh, the venom is thermolabile, which means we can break it down with heat. That is one of the key things we're gonna see from now on, that many times the mechanism or the first, first aids that we can provide, they have to do with the application of heat. And I'm hoping that by the end you will understand why we sometimes apply it, why sometimes it doesn't make any sense to provide heat to break down the protein, uh, and why sometimes we try to do you know, other strategies. And the rationale is the venom is a protein, and the proteins have a structure, right? They have 
a primary structure, a secondary, a tertiary, and a quaternary. So the primary structure is the amino acids just lay down one after the other. The secondary structure is when we put them and we fold this line. The tertiary is when we fold it again. Let's say that the fourth or the quaternary structure is when we get different proteins and we put them all together. Finally, we have the protein that is the toxin. When we apply heat, what we're doing is we're breaking this down until eventually we no longer have the toxin. So that's why we sometimes apply heat. So that's the spine that we were talking before, and that's the real thing, right, with the sheet and everything. And that is the spine of a stonefish. We don't have any stonefish in the Atlantic. We have some um, scorpion fish, uh, uh, but not stonefish. So sometimes, you know, it's important when you go to other places where these creatures are, are, are endemic, and you may be walking on a tide pool, and you may be thinking that, you know, I'm, I'm fine, I'm wearing my, my, my Crocs or something, so I, I have some good protection. Let me tell you, when you step on one of those animals uh, on top of that spine, your Crocs offer no protection at all. And let's see with this clip here. So I'm sure you can see the animal there, and if you can't, maybe I play the movie and you will now see it. Okay, so it's really hard to see it until they move. That's... I hope you, you can see that, you know, you, you have no protection. That's a great image where you can see the, the venom being injected by, the, by squeezing that gland, right? Those are the, the hemorrhages, the subcutaneous hemorrhage that you sometimes see, and that guy having such a degree of pain, most likely he did step on a, on a stonefish or a or penny form rather than, than, than a lionfish. So... What are you going to be seeing? So this is intends to be the, the animation of, of your skin, right? So we have the top layer, that is the epidermis, and then we have the lower layer, that's the dermis, and subcutaneous tissue, the fatty tissues, and then we have, you know, blood vessels going up to the, to the dermis. So when the spine gets embedded in your skin, eventually the venom is deposited very deep into the tissues, as deep as the spine went into your tissues. The first thing that happens after that, when the spine is removed, the puncture wound gets flooded with blood. And our first reaction is usually when we have a puncture wound and it's bleeding, to try to stop the bleed by putting our thumb. Now that is not the best thing, because when we're doing that, we're preventing the venom eventually to be flushed away with the blood. So if, if the blood is not significant, of course, right, if, if you didn't hit a, a major artery, let that wound bleed for a couple of seconds, because that blood flowing will hopefully minimize the amount of venom that, it, that, gets, that eventually gets stuck in that, in that deep puncture wound. So now what we can do is remember the venom is thermolabile. We can break it down with heat. So we try to apply heat. And the, again, the rationale is we break down those proteins. But if the venom was injected that deep into the wound, does it make any sense to apply heat at the surface? Because eventually heat will dissipate the deeper it goes, right? So heat is not very selective. If, if we increase the temperature on the surface to reach a higher temperature down at the bottom, we will actually cause burns all the way through. So then why do we apply heat? Well, the rationale for why we apply heat on some of these deep puncture wounds is because heat also helps us manage the pain. Okay, so we have two good reasons to apply heat. One, if the puncture wound, if the venom was injected very superficially in the skin, we can actually break down some of that protein, some of that toxin, and hopefully minimize the injury. And if it's deep enough, we may not be doing much to the toxin, but we are um, helping manage pain, which can be significant. So how do these cases present? What, is the, what are the manifestations? It's, like we said before, intense pain. The pain can last for several hours. Usually following the pain, we have redness and edema or swelling. Usually like we saw on, those, on that clip before, uh, the patients will develop some purple plaques, which are a manifestation of subcutaneous hemorrhage, not necessarily in the puncture wound side, but sometimes, you know, a few inches, and sometimes, for instance, if the puncture wound is in the hand, you know, they can have some subcutaneous hemorrhage around the forearm. So don't expect those to be precisely on the puncture wound. The swelling usually resolves in two to three days, and the blood collections, of course, depending on how much and how significant it is, and of course, the person itself, how sensible they are, they may last a little bit longer, four to five days. So we'll show some pictures here that hopefully, you know, if, you, if you're a sensible person, you may want to close your eyes on the next one in particular. 
So the edema can become rapidly significant and can lead to ischemia, so to, to an impaired perfusion if it is in a terminal uh, uh, side of your body, like your, your fingers. So the same puncture wound happening on your fingertip may not have the same effect as the same puncture wound on your thigh. Why? Because on your fingertip, there's not much tissue to eventually dissolve that toxin, while on your thigh, it can dissolve much faster. So it's a, it's a concept that we call the volume of distribution, or distribution volume, and that, that, that is important to keep in mind, right? Particularly with, with your fingers, you need to be careful. So again, uh, images uh, that may be sensible to some people, here we go, so close your eyes if you're uh, uh, not friendly of those. So this is an image that one of our members shared with us after being punctured by, by a lionfish. And we can see different things here. So there is some significant, you know, subcutaneous hemorrhage there. This may or may not go to necrosis, but he also applied heat and he actually put some, you know, pretty high temperature water. He's put his finger in high temperature water. So it is possible that here we're dealing with two things, not just the, the, the puncture from this animal, but also some thermal burns. And we see the same thing there. So as a rule of thumb, one of the things that we can uh, keep in mind is you need good temperature to eventually denature proteins. You need a little bit more than, you know, 45 or uh, 45, 60 degrees C's. That is like 130, I think, Fahrenheit. And you may not have a, a thermometer uh, on the dive boat. So as a rule of thumb, what you can do is you can try the hottest water you as a rescuer can tolerate on the same area where the patient or the, the injured diver has the injury. So never try, never allow the diver to test it himself because with the degree of pain he has, he may not be able to tell you this is way too hot, I'm, 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 this is burning. So try it yourself. If you can tolerate it on the same area where he needs this water to be applied, then most likely it is safe for him or her to use. Yeah, so, yeah. He did well, but you know, it, it took a long time. So how bad are these injuries? Again, out of all the fish that could potentially cause you know, puncture wounds, uh, I'm sure that some of you, you probably fish too, and you eventually you got some puncture wound with a catfish or a grouper or something like that. And yes, they hurt, they, they can be bad, but they don't have any specific venom. Now, out of those that do have a venom, perhaps the first one is the soapfish in terms of pain. Then we have lionfish to the right, then we have scorpionfish, and then much farther away on the further right, we have stonefish. These are the ones that can be really, really, uh, can, they can really hurt. Yeah. Okay, so what to do if you have these puncture wounds? Um, well, first you have to clean the area carefully. Okay, you don't want any rubbing. Sometimes rubbing can increase, you know, when, it, when, when the patient feels it's hot because of the rubbing, that means we're increasing perfusion in the area and that increased perfusion might actually help the venom load. Now, this may be something you do want to do on some areas to minimize, you know, the impact on, the, say, on the fingertip. Uh, but, you know, some, you need to be careful with that. You do want to apply antiseptic solutions if you have them and if you don't have them, well, maybe you should on your, on your first aid kit. And then remember what we talked about thermolysis, applying temperature to, to manage these injuries. Now, and also consider the risks, right? Remember, you don't want to cause a secondary a burn just to, in, in your attempt to try to, to help this, this diver. Now, it is important also for every diver to have good coverage for tetanus, okay? So these injuries, they are potentially, like we say, tetanogenic. Uh, the, the bacteria, the germ that causes tetanus is absolutely everywhere. It's in the ocean, it's in the sand, it's at the beach, it's at the carpet on your home, it's actually in your guts right now. The only thing it needs is the right environment to eventually start releasing that toxin. And the right environment is precisely a deep puncture wound that gets infected. So don't let them get infected. And if they happen to get infected, make sure that when someone has a deep puncture wound, when you send them to a hospital to be taken care of, make sure that they ask them and that they have a good coverage for tetanus. Now, in terms of the treatment, for most species is symptomatic treatment, so you attack the symptoms, and there's a specific treatment for some species, particularly the mimetic species, 
Now, again, we don't have them in this part of the world, but if you're somewhere else, like in the Indo-Pacific, in Australia, New Zealand, well, in those places, they, these animals are endemic, and most likely at the ERs, they do have the anti-venom. So what happens here in, in the Atlantic Ocean, in the Caribbean in particular, is uh, back in the 90s, I think it was, uh, these species were found here, and they're not endemic. They are an invasive species. So NOAA, they, they wanted to know what was happening, and they actually put an email and a phone number for people to report when, when they had some, some sighting. And the same thing with reef. And over the years, you know, our approach changed because we know that we're very unlikely to win this war, this battle. And so here we see some lionfish cooling uh, licenses in, 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 I think it's in the Cayman, and, and the expiration date is indefinite. So yes, uh, kill them. And, and they try to teach, you know, sharks on how to eat them. And, it, you know, it's, it's, as far as I understand, it's controversial. And now our approach is different. Now we want to eat them until extinction. So have at it. And actually, it's, it's really good. If you haven't tried it, it's, it's tasty. We received some reports about some mutant species. Here's where I expect you to, to laugh, and I hope you're having a chuckle <laughs> at home. <laughs> so that's as much as we can say and, and, and talk about fish in particular. Uh, again, there are many fish. Not all of them have a specific toxin. So for those that don't have a toxin, well, try to avoid them, but know that there's nothing specific you can do. Try to prevent infections, take care of the wound, uh, have good coverage for tetanus, and well, hope you, hopefully you learned the lesson. So let's jump now to stingrays. So not all rays have a sting. There's a specific suborder that have a sting. I'm not a biologist, and I'm sure that you know some people may be arguing or finding errors in my my you know classifications. I did the best I can. I apologize if I'm not exactly accurate. So you know there's places like this, like Stingray City in the Bahamas, where you know they take tourists. Um, and, all over and they have them interact with the animals. I never did that. You need to be careful, right? These animals, they're, you can tame those animals and to a degree they are somehow unpredictable. Uh, we don't hear a lot of, a lot of fat, you know, life-threatening cases with stingrays, but those that happen, they are challenging. So some people really like the experience and they really enjoy them and some others have a little bit of a hard time while ex interacting with them. So what can we say about these animals? So they're very widely distributed in all oceans. This species in particular, the Dajatis americana, you can find them from, say, southern New Jersey all the way down to Uruguay in South America. But don't be fooled. I mean, there are species, similar species from different uh, genuses all over tropical and subtropical oceans. They look pretty much the same, and they all have a sting. They're peaceful fish, they're bottom dwellers, they're closely related to sharks, which means they don't have any bones, they have a cartilage, and they're by no means aggressive. The problem with, with them is when we are walking where they usually uh, live, and they live partially buried in the sand, and if we are unlucky enough to step on them, eventually we get an injury. So how do we get an injury? Well, at the base of their tail, they have this barb. So here you can see an image of this bar, but you may say, but Matthias, hold on, you just said they don't have any bones. And true, they don't have any bones. What you see here is not a bone, it's a very dense cartilage. And it is dry, and it can dry in, actually, yes, look like a bone. So the barb is in a pouch-like cavity, and when they get threatened, when they feel uncomfortable, eventually they will whip them with their tail and, you know, cause an injury. So here we have like a cross-sectional cut of, the, of that barb, and we see the tissues covering the barb, and underneath the tissues, between the tissues and the barb, there are some glands, and they produce some substance, and eventually that's when we get, you know, these this injuries. So if you're ever close to animals, like this diver is here, uh, when you see them, uh, you know, acquiring this position, this... Um, um, defensive position, like arced backwards, beware. That means the animal is as close to, you know, attack you, or I should say defend itself as possible. So don't get any closer because it can cause some serious injuries. So here's when we will show some images. I said there was not going to be any blood, but well, for those that came here to see blood, well, there is some. So important thing to say about stingrays. They can hurt, the, the, the injuries can hurt, they can be problematic, 
they don't have any specific toxin. Therefore, we can't make any anti-venom. So they have a mixture of substances, and all the substances, we already have them in our body. But the problem is when, you know, when they get inoculated with, with the barbs, eventually they cause some, some, some trouble. So the venom can cause intense, intense pain. One of the main features is that it is characteristic that this proportion between the size of the wound and the reported pain. Uh, the, the pain can intensify for several hours. So if you see someone that got stung by, by a stingray and they are in, in, in a high degree of pain, most likely the pain will get worse before it gets any better. Okay, so be prepared to manage some pretty serious pain. And if you send them, because of course we highly encourage you to send the, this diver to, to the doctor, the doctors may or may not know this, but uh, more often than not, these injuries, they do get infected. So just mention that to the doctor. They may want to be proactive and prescribe some prophylactic antibiotics. So on something, you know, some so small as this small barb here, that can cause some very, very significant pain. Okay, beware, another, another image, gruesome image is coming. So, you know, between folklore things, in, in, in some parts of the world, they have this folkloric ways to deal with, with animals. And so in the northern part of Brazil, the divers, divers, sorry, the fishermen, they know that if they, if they fish a stingray, they should grab the stingray by the operculum. The operculum are the two orifices where they have the gills. So this is what this diver did. He grabbed the stingray by the operculum. And of course, the stingray did what he was supposed to do, so whipping with a tail, and eventually uh, getting this barb into this uh, fisherman's hand. So as you can imagine, that hurts quite a bit. And here we have some images, some x-rays. So the cartilage is so dense that you can actually see it on x-rays. On the image on the, on the right, you can see the thickness of that hand that is sideways. So there is some very significant swelling there. Now, on a very small barb, Remember, it's cartilage, and cartilage is radiolucid, so you may not see it on x-rays. And sometimes some debris may remain there, and they may cause troubles for months. Another gruesome image, beware. So this is a diver that got stung on his foot, on a, actually a pretty small stingray. Based on the size of that tail, that animal was most likely maybe what? Foot in diameter? And the doctor doesn't have the best tools, so that's why you see the wiggling there. That's, yeah. And it's important here, so see what the technique of this doctor is to remove this barb. Okay, so he's taking it from the other side. Because those barbs, they go one way only. Okay? Now you would say, okay, so done. No, remember, the barb is covered with some soft tissues. And most likely, those soft tissues remain there in that injury. So this gentleman most likely has a long, long and most likely torpid recovery over months, many, many months, and pain and sometimes with limited range of motion and fibrosis. So yeah, it's best to avoid these things from scratch. So what to do with those animals? Well, remember, pain can be very, very significant. So your first uh, measure should be controlling pain with anything, anything you have handy. So don't wait for this to get any worse. Send this diver, the, the, the fisherman, whatever, send them to a hospital and have them uh, professionally taking care of that pain. Now, some of the substances they have as a, as a venom they can be broken down with temperature. So you can apply temperature and maybe, you know, hopefully control some of that effect. And if you don't control, if you can break down all those substances, at least you may be helping with managing pain. One thing I didn't mention is you may not have hot water, but maybe you have ice. Well, you know, the extremes of temperature, they can help with managing pain. Ice perhaps may not be that effective, but you can try it too if you don't have any hot water. Then, of course, you will wash out the, the injury uh, sometimes because, like we said before, the barbs, you know, they're really lucid. They are cartilage. You may not see them on x-rays. So for the doctors in the audience and for you, if you remember when you send your, your body to the doctor, you know, have a careful surgical exploration to find out if there are any debris, any small piece, pieces of, 
uh, hard tissue or soft tissue too. Of course, coverage for tetanus, and there's uh, some particular uh, bacteria that we want to make sure that you know you never get it, and that's Vibrio. So sea snakes. So what can we say about sea snakes? Other than they're absolutely gorgeous, beautiful, beautiful animals. So for the next few slides, I want you to forget about sea snakes, about diving, and let's remember or talk about how to have a pretty decent idea on what are venomous snakes versus non-venomous snakes. As divers, we like outdoors activities, so I'm sure that diving is not the only thing you do outdoors. So if you happen to encounter a snake, these things may help you determine if you should just leave it alone or if you can have a closer look because, again, I find them pretty beautiful animals. So, what we see on this slide are all the features that usually, usually, venomous snakes have. So when you see a snake where you can clearly differentiate a head, a neck, a body, and a tail, those features are usually by shared by, by uh, venomous snakes. If we flip the animal over here, you can see that most likely from here, if we flip it, we will have the cloaca of the animal, the anus. So what we see uh, going forward, most likely there are some internal organs, and from then on, everything is a muscular tail. When you see the scales on the head, they have some sort of a ridge, some sort of texture. Those are features of venomous snakes. When you look at their eyes, and their eyes have a slit, like elliptical pupil, like those of cats, those are usually features of venomous snake. When you look closely into the eyes, and you see that in between the nostril and the eye, there's a second depression. That second depression is the loreal pit, which communicates with the corti organ, which has nothing to do with our corti organ. This is the main sensory organ for snakes, and it helps them see the heat coming from their prey. And finally, when you see, when you look at the scales on the body and you see they're keeled or rhomboid scales, they don't look like those of fish. Usually those are features of venomous snakes. So Brian, based on what I've just said, what would you say this is? I would vote venomous. Right, so first thing we see is that, you know, uh, elliptical pupil, right? Those are features of venomous snakes. Now you can see the nostril in this animal, but the nostril is actually here. So in between the nostril and the eye, we see the second depression. That second depression is the corti or uh, the loreal pit. So that's a feature of, usually, a feature of venomous snakes. Notice that I'm saying usually, so mm -hmm. I'll get there. And also on the scales on the head, we see they have some sort of a texture or a, or a ridge, right? So clearly venomous snake. So what about this one? That one also looks venomous to me. Right, so we have the nostril here. The eye, the laurel pit, the elongated pupils. See, they, those scales, they look like coffee beans. Actually, they don't overlap one with the other. So yeah, features of venomous snake. This one, clearly, this doesn't have many friends. So laurel pit, sorry, nostril, laurel pit, eye, elongated pupil. The, the skins are flat, but they're rhomboid, okay? So what about here? Based on my knowledge of snakes, I think those snakes want to choke me. <laughs> That's right. So, look at those features. They have elongated pupils, and we said, well, elongated pupils are usually features of venomous snakes. These are pythons, and pythons are not venomous. They can be deadly, and they can be very dangerous, but actually they don't have any venom. They can kill you because they're big, they can be very strong and muscular, and they can choke you, you're right, but they don't have any venom at all. Here we can see also they have this uh, sort of loreal pits. So again, some of the features of the venomous snakes, but they don't have any venom. Actually, they don't have any fangs. What about this one? This one's tricky. Uh, venomous because of the ridges on the scales? Right, and also look at those eyes, and when you see something that colorful, that is screaming at you, don't get any close to me. Okay, so yeah. Okay, what about this one? Very colorful too. Sure, well, um, I don't see ridges on the scales. It's a round pupil. I do see a l'oreal pit. Uh, could go either way. I'm going to vote non-venomous. Okay, so this is a scarlet snake. So these are non-venomous. Mm -hmm. In other countries, this is known as a false coral snake. Remember the mnemonic where we say red in between, la in between black, venom lacks. Careful with that because there are many species that may look similar, and the mnemonic doesn't necessarily apply with all the ones that you do need to be careful about. 
Now, Probably useful in North America, but right. questionable elsewhere. North America, Central America, that works, but not everywhere. Um, now, what you see here, that is not the laurel pit. Ah. That is actually the nostril. Okay. So they don't have a laurel pit. Okay. Round pupils, right on spot. Flat scales, very smooth. They're not rounded. They don't have any edges, so mm -hmm. non-venomous. What about this one? This one looks like uh, you're gonna, trying to trick me. <laughs> Say, right. So... Pay attention to those features. So flat scales, very flat, absolutely no neck whatsoever, right? Mm -hmm. Round pupils, no laurel pit. So nostrils. this looks, and actually those scales, they look like those of fish, right? Flat, right. no texture whatsoever. So and there's a coral reef behind it, right? <laughs> exactly. So this uh, snake has all the physical features of a non-venomous snake. However, this is a sea snake, and guess what? Sea snakes are the most venomous snakes of all snakes in the world. So what about this one? Uh, on I'm flat gonna, scales. Yep. You, I don't know if you can see there on your screens at home, but those pivots are round. They mm -hmm. don't have a laurel pit. Okay. Well, I can see the head ends here, but where's the neck, where's the rest of the body? I really don't know. Wait a minute, that looks paddle like, a, like a paddle tail, right? Yeah. And it's in a reef, so that is another sea snake belongs to the same family, has all the features of a, of a non-venomous being highly venomous. So this is not a sea snake. And again, all the features of a non-venomous snake, right? So right. round pupils, flat scales, no ridges, no nothing. Mm -hmm. This is where the head ends, but who knows where the neck ends. So this, my friends, this is a black mamba. Black mambas are the largest African venomous snake. It's called black not because of the color of the, the skin, but actually because of the color of the mouth. You see they have this black, velvety black in, the, in, the, in their mouth. And yeah, again, highly, highly venomous. And they don't look like it. So now you're really confused, right? And let's do one more. So you can't see the pupil, but trust me, it's round, flat scales. We do know this is actually a coral snake. Red in between yellow kills a fellow. Now, if you pay attention to those features we talked about before, this one has all the features of a non-venomous snake being, as you all know, highly venomous. If I show you this one, round pupil, flat scales, no ridges, you may see, hmm, that looks like a non-venomous snake. But when I see you, show you the rest of the animal, you all recognize that is a cobra and that is one that you should stay away from. Just to bring it home, all these animals that I talked about, that they don't follow the descriptions and the logic that we try to learn today, they all belong to the same family. So sea snakes are a subspecies or a subfamily of elapids. And the elapids are the cobras, the coral snakes, and the black mambas, they all belong to the same family. So this big family of, of, sea, of snakes, including the sea snakes, they have all the features of the non-venomous snakes being the most venomous at all. So, what can we say about sea snakes? There are about 60 species of marine uh, uh, snakes and only seven have been found to be lethal to humans. Like we said before, they are a subfamily of elapids. There are no sea snakes in the Atlantic. They all belong to the Indo-Pacific. So if you see something that looks like a snake in the Caribbean, it's either not a snake or it's a snake in the water, but not a sea snake. Now, as we know, uh, snakes are um, uh, reptiles, so they can control the body temperature. So in order to have an idea on how far north and how far south you can find them, you know, they need temperature to keep up with their basic metabolism. So they don't tolerate waters uh, lower than 68 degrees Fahrenheit or 20 degrees Cs. They're not aggressive, but they can be very curious. So if you're diving in the, in, in the Southeast Asia region, you may, be find, you may find one of these animals. Don't be afraid, they're curious. They will come right to you. We have never heard of anybody being attacked by a sea snake. So don't be afraid. Of course, don't put your hand on them, but um, if you see them at land, don't ever handle them because when they feel threatened, they may actually bite. And although they usually, the bites usually don't result in envenomation, you don't want to handle them anyway. Now, sea snakes, uh, snakes, you can, you know, organize them into different um, uh, categories based on their skull and their dentition. So sea snakes or elapids, they belong to a group that are called proteroglyphus. 
So this uh, funny terms means pro meaning forward, glyphos meaning glyph or fang. So the fangs are the, at the beginning of the mouth or at the front of the mouth. The fangs are very short, they only have two to three millimeters, and they don't penetrate deep into your flesh or neoprene because they're so short. Usually they can't open their mouth big enough to bite you. Now, if they bite you between your fingers, that could be an issue. It is important to know that uh, the venom doesn't contain any proteolytic enzymes, so if you get bitten and it doesn't hurt, don't be fooled. You can have the toxin embedded and it won't hurt because, again, the, the venom is only mostly neurotoxic, but it won't hurt your, 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 your tissue. You won't, you won't feel that. So here's what I was talking about the dentition. So we have four groups of snakes. So the aglyphus, a meaning lacking, so no fangs. These are the pythons. You see they have teeth, but they don't have any fangs. Opistoglyphos, opisto meaning backward. So here we see the fangs. The fangs are facing backward. So they can have some venom, they can be dangerous, but they usually can't bite you because of the type of dentition they have. They, they are not, I mean, any, humans are too big of a prey. Then we have the solenoglyphos. So think of a solenoid, a coil. So these are the, the crotalus, the rattlesnakes. They have large fans. The fangs are actually retractile. The fangs are hollow and they connect with some glands and the glands are connected with some muscles so they can jump at you, bite, squeeze the gland, inject the venom and move on. Very, very effective way of injecting venom. Now, our friends, the sea snakes, like I said before, they belong to this family, proteroglyphos, so the fangs are here at the beginning of the mouth. Those fangs are not hollow, they have a rear groove. They're not retractile, they're fixed. They are not connected to glands that have uh, uh, muscles to squeeze them. So for them to bite you and envenomate you, they need to bite, remain latched for a while, and eventually the venom needs to drip through that rear groove, embed the surface of the wound, and eventually you may get some of that venom into your tissues and get an envenomation. So re even if you get bitten, really hard to get an envenomation. You would never disregard it anyway. You would send that patient for evaluation and they should keep them under observation for a good number of hours to rule out uh, bigger issues, right? And what could the bigger issues be? If the toxin is a neurotoxin, eventually people die because they can't breathe, they forget to breathe. Well, they don't forget, they just can't move their muscles. So serious envenomations, they will be obvious within two hours. If after about eight hours of observation, there are no serious manifestation and, and no, no respiratory depression, well, most likely the doctor will determine that this is a bite without envenomation. Always, always seek medical evaluation because these patients, they need to be monitored. Now, there is a, a specific treatment for these animals and it's developed by the Commonwealth Serum Laboratories of Australia and they do develop this venom in the regions where this, these animals are commonly found. So, enough about vertebrates. Let's jump into invertebrates. Let's go into the cnidarians, which are perhaps uh, the most common or the most uh, uh, feared animals that divers uh, deal with. So the film is cnidaria, formerly known as celenterate, and there are three or four classes that we need to at least say something. So the first class is the hydrozoans. Among the hydrozoans, we will see animals that they don't look anything alike and they belong to the same family. Then on the class Cephozoans and Cubozoans, these are actually the true jellyfish. And finally, we'll talk about the Anthozoans, which are anemones and polyps. So, the common feature of all cnidarians is the presence of cnidocytes. So, the cnidocyte is a, speci a, specialized, uh, sorry, a specialized cell. So, as you can see, these are the tentacles of any type of jellyfish. In this animation, we see the tentacle. And then if we zoom in in that tentacle, we see that some cells, they do have some spike. Those are the nidocytes. Now, this is the nidocyte. So picture the nidocyte as a, as a hand grenade, okay? And that hand grenade has a trigger. So when you mechanically touch that trigger, this cap will pop open. Now, inside that hand grenade, which is the cell, there is a subcellular structure called the nematocyst. So the nematocyst is this inner structure within the nidocyte. And the nematocyst is filled with liquid, which is actually the venom, and it's at a higher pressure than the surrounding cell. So when, the, when we touch the trigger and the cap pops open, 
this structure deploys from the inside out, like what you see here, and eventually they tap on the prey and they inject the venom, okay? So this is just an animation, and here you can see the real thing, right? So that is a nematocyst deployed and attacking that, whatever that is, that cell, that little animal there. You can see all those spikes. So this is the unfired nematocyst with all the coil inside, and when somebody touched that trigger, it deployed. So here we can see another picture with many, many different nematocysts. Some of them are fired, some of them are unfired. Okay? Here we see the same type of nematocysts, all of them fired, right? They deployed their barb. And here we can see them, not only they deploy their barb, but the barb is actually embedded in their prey. Now, on the next image, I'll show you a video. So the mechanism of actually deploying that structure from the inside out, inside out is so fast. It's actually one of the fastest mechanisms known in nature. So take a look at this. 1,500 frames per second. This is really slow motion. And you will see how actually the animal fires. Can you see it? Right? Really, really absurdly fast. Okay, so... All cnidarians, regardless of the species, the genus, the family, they all have nematocysts. So what do you see here? I'm pretty sure that most of you know what this is. This is fire coral. Now, fire coral, of course, is a cnidarian, and it has those structures, and you can see those nematocysts, those hair-like structures here. Now, the problem with fire coral is not necessarily when you touch them, which, of course, they can cause some burning sensation, some, some you know, blisters and so on, but the problem is these animals, they belong to a class of animals which are hydrozoans, and they do have some particular features. And some of them is that the injuries, the venom they have, they, they have a tendency to cause uh, skin necrosis, okay? So if somebody has such a poor neutral buoyancy that instead of, you know, keeping neutral in the water, they land on the reef, and they're not wearing any, any uh, wetsuit, and they land, let's say, but first, well, now you have an open wound, right? Which not only it, it hurts and it may bleed, but also there's some venomation on the edges of that wound. So of course, you'll take this patient, this diver, to a doctor, and the doctor may see the wound side, and hopefully it's a small cut, and the doctor may say, you know what, this is a clear cut, I can put some stitches and you'll be fine. Now, remember, those uh, barbs, they, sorry, those uh, nematocysts, they have some specific toxin, and the, the edges of that wound may become necrotic. So do mention that to the doctor. The doctor may choose to, instead of put some stitches, leave it to heal by what we call second intention, which is you just leave it open, you just take care of it. Will it leave a mark? Yeah, chances are it will, but you, you don't want the edges to become necrotic and to have a, you know, a secondary infection. So <clears throat> remember that the, the, particularly with, with fire coral, uh, you can't use their shape to identify them. You need to use you know, their appearance and particularly the color. They will acquire a different shape depending on where they are. They may not always look like branches like what we see before or like plagues like what we see here. Sometimes they just cover any sub substrate and even a, a wreck. And they, when you see that rusty yellowish color, that is uh, fire coral. So symptoms, intense pain, redness, erythema, which is uh, redness, itchiness, and burning sensation. Very rarely more serious manifestations. But remember, the toxin has hemolytic, so it will break down some blood cells and dermonecrotic activity. What you see here, this is a hydroid. So the stinging hydroids, which many people refer to them as, I touched a plant and now I have this, these blisters. Well, this is not a plant. This is an animal. It's particularly the larval stage of animals belonging to the class Hydrozoa. So they're mostly colonial. A few, very few species are in fresh water. The same as with, with Onidarians, they do have nematocysts. So when you touch them, you will make them fire. So touching them, you know, swimming really close to the reef and, you know, brushing against these plants, eventually you can have these injuries. Um, when you put them in fresh water, they may also, you know, release all the toxin because you're changing the environment where they are. The type of injuries, you know, it depends. Some people may have some redness and some people may have some blisters that night or the day, be the day following day. 
And one of the things that is characteristic is that sometimes they call us and they say, you know what, I touched these animals, and I, the next day I had some blisters. Over the course of the following week, the blisters, they ran out, and I was fine, but this has been two weeks already. I'm back home in New York, and now all the, all the blisters came back out of, out of nothing. So for some reason, that is somehow characteristic for hydrozoites, for stinging hydroids. So keep that in mind. So Portuguese man of war. And some people will see this animal and say, oh, that's, that's one of the many jellyfish that I'm afraid of. Well, technically, this is not a jellyfish. It belongs to a different group of animals. This is also a hydrozoan. So it belongs to the same group of animals as the fire coral or the, or the stinging hydroids. So this beautiful, gorgeous animal, let's try to dissect this animal. So what you see here is actually not a single animal. A single specimen is actually a colony of different polyps, all specialized into a certain function. So one of the polyps is known as the pneumatophore, or marisa or sail. That's the bladder you see here that is usually filled with gas. Interestingly enough, this gas is usually air for the most part, but it can contain up to 14% of carbon monoxide. Now, of course, this doesn't have any toxicological implications. Nobody's going to be puncturing this animal and stiffing it. But for some reason, I mean, they, they managed to either synthesize or, 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 or have carbon monoxide in it. The other type of, of animals are, or, or, or the, sorry, polyps are the gonozoids. These are meant for re reproduction. Then we have the gastrozoids, meant for feeding. These are like hanging stomachs. And finally, the dactylozoids. These are meant for defense. Now, there are two species for the genus Physalia. One is Physalia physalis, which is the species we have in the Atlantic Ocean, and one is Physalia utriculus. Physalia physalis is slightly larger than utriculus, and this may be the one creature where our version beats the Australian version. The, the species on the Indo-Pacific apparently is a little bit less, uh, tends to, help, to cause less systemic symptoms than, than Physalia physalis, and it's a little bit smaller too. Now, into the, the name, so right, so where's the name coming from? So Portuguese man of war. So I would say that, you know, somebody with a lot of imagination, they saw man of war. So they said, well, there's the hull of the boat, right, the ship, and the marisa or sail, those are the sails, and the tentacles are, are all the tentacles, you know, the ropes coming from the, from the you know, the man of war. And I would say that, that is because they have never seen an empanada. So they, I think a proper name should have been the Blue Empanada of Death. Okay, I'm being silly here, sorry. Um, it is important to know that Physalia, or Portuguese Man of War, is among the creatures that tends to cause the most uh, varied type of manifestations. Usually when you have a puncture, sorry, an, an injury with a, with a jellyfish, most likely the symptoms are limited to the area where you have the contact. Now with Physalia, uh, they have a high tendency to cause systemic symptoms all over your body, not just on the, on the, on the side of contact, but sometimes, you know, muscular spasms in your back and, and, and you know, vomiting and, and feeling really, really not very well. Now, we do know that the protein, sorry, the toxin is a protein. And what did we say we can do with proteins? Well, we can break them down by applying heat. And we say that one of the caveats by applying heat is, well, if the puncture wound is deep, and we suspect the venom has been injected very deep into, into your skin, we do know that applying heat at the surface is likely not going to reach enough temperature deep into your tissues. But here, now we know how the nematocysts work. And if we can infer that, you know, the, the venom was injected very, very superficially in your skin, then application of heat, it is expected to be very efficient, very effective in trying to, you know, denature that protein and managing pain. Now remember, these are hydrozoans, and hydrozoans, they do have that hemolytic activity. So when you send the patient to the hospital, they will draw some blood. They may find some funky stuff in the blood work, and that might be the result of this hemolytic activity. Clinical manifestations. So, you know, red um, uh, uh, injuries like what you see here on this arm, eventually they can progress into vesicles uh, with time. Serious cases, generalized weakness, nausea, vomiting. Remember, we talked about all those symptoms at distance, not just on the, on the site. Now, you don't need to be a, a biologist, a toxinologist, or anything to identify a physalia. If you see someone 
uh, in a tropical area where these animals, you know, happen to be, and you see them, you know, in intense pain and covered with some blue tentacles, that's it. You know this is Physalia. So you may say, what, what, what should I do with those tentacles, right? So should I remove them? Yes, you should try to remove them. Now, how should I remove them? Well, remember that we talked about the, the, the nematocysts as a hand grenade. So you need to be careful in what you do with that hand grenade. So should you rub the area? Never. If you rub the area, what you're doing is, remember the, the tentacle is a three-dimensional thing, so you have nematocysts in touch with your skin, but you also have on the top of the tentacle. So if you rub the area, you're actually increasing the size of the wound or the, the injury. So you need to be very careful. So if you have tweezers, you would use tweezers and you can remove them. Tentacles from jellyfish, they're usually very fragile and it's hard to see them because they're usually clear and when you have a clear tentacle that looks like jelly and then on top you have water, everything is shiny and you don't know where the tentacle is and isn't. And when you try to remove them, they break down easily. Now with Physalia, these are very, very resistant to traction. So if you have tweezers, you use those tweezers and you can remove the whole thing in one piece. If you don't have any tweezers and you have gloves, use your gloves. If you don't have any gloves, get a, a, a plastic bag and use it as gloves. If you don't have any gloves, any plastic bags, the only thing you have is your hands. Can you use your hands? Well, you can, you can because the, the skin on the tip of your fingers is thick enough that the nematocysts are not gonna fire you. Now, you need to be very careful what you do with that hands, those hands afterwards, right? This is like handling jalapenos. You're not gonna touch your eyes or your face after manipulating these animals because you will get an injury. So you would treat your hands the same way you would treat this, and we will get there in a few in a couple of slides. Go ahead. Quick, uh, you're still in Phasalia. I wanted to jump in with a few uh, questions. Well, yeah. We, it, it might as well. Um, so looking back where, we, where we've uh, been so far, quick question about stingray barbs. Yep. Someone asked about if they would show up on ultrasound. Yes, okay. they will. Great. Absolutely. Uh, next question about stingray barbs, and this person did feel like y this was answered in your presentation, but just in case anybody else was wondering, um, asked about removal. And the first thing that occurred to me was, in general, the recommendation is not to remove foreign bodies Correct. Uh, outside of a clinical setting. Correct. Correct. Um, but, unless, you're, yeah. unless you know what you're doing, you shouldn't remove them because you don't know if that foreign body is actually you know, covering a, a major artery. Mm -hmm. And then when you remove it, well, then you have a bigger problem, which is uh, massive bleeding. bleeding. Yeah. yeah. And Good so that, that's, that's part of the answer. The other part, as you saw in that clinical setting, in that case, it was the right choice to push it through. So that's what the doctor yes, did. Yes, always pushing it through because it's much easier. They have this mm -hmm. barb and this, you know, like a hook, so it only goes one way. Okay. You can make it go the other way, but you're only going <laughs> to make gonna it. You're not going to like it. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, quick question. Someone asked about the difference between venom and poison. I think this was answered pretty well in the chat, but venom has a delivery method. Is well, that yeah. So if, if venom is a poisonous thing is what you ingest, and if you ingest it, it can cause something. If something mm -hmm. venomous is you don't need to ingest it. When it gets embedded, eventually you get the, the effects. Great. And this is the, the final one I wanted to jump on before we got too far past it and we lost anyone in the chat who's interested in this because the chat is, uh, is interested in this. as as audiences are always interested in this, in what circumstances does Dan recommend urinating on <laughs> hazardous marine life injuries? Okay, so I, I was hoping that somebody would ask that <laughs> question because that is part of the folklore. So, I mean, there's lots of things, you know, folkloric methods to deal with these things. I don't know exactly what the rationale is, my interpretation and why, you know, maybe they were saying, you know, use urine is, well, one of the things we use, and we will get there, I think, on the next slide, on how to, to manage uh, the, the injuries with these animals is you should apply vinegar. And they say, well, it's the, the, the acidity in the vinegar, so urine is acid. Well, not necessarily. And then we may say, well, it, urine contains uh, ammonia. Right, and ammonia, it can be used to try to manipulate that nematocyst. Again, we will get there in a few slides. But um, it's not the most effective thing. Um, and then, well, it's hot. Well, it's body temperature. You're not going to denature anything with that. And like I always say to you know people that you know call the hotline or, or the information line, I don't care how body we are. We don't pee on me. <laughs> yeah, uh, it, it's it's just folklore. There are many things you can use, but 
I think everybody agrees these days that the best way to treat this is just white household vinegar. Again, we'll get there. But So bear with me. Any other questions? No, that's all the questions that have come up in the chat so far. So we're caught up uh, okay, so until okay. now. But keep them coming, and yeah. we'll uh, hit them again at the end. Yeah. All right. So what we see here, this little creature, this is a sea slug. The sea slug is called Glaucus atlanticus. It's a tiny slug, what you see there. So this little buddy, together with sea turtles, are the only two predators for Physalia. And the, what is interesting about this animal is not only they can eat Physalia and have absolutely no effects, but they can eat the tentacles and swallow the nematocysts, and the nematocysts go absolutely untouched through their digestive system. And the little sea slug, they actually use the nematocyst or the Physalia on their branchia, which are those branches you see there, as their own defense. So bottom line is handling these animals surface by surface, they could potentially have the same effect as handling a small piece of Visalia, but the same size of the animal. Um, so you see that the, somebody there is handling them uh, with their hands, so I would say not a very good idea, but be careful. We do know that your skin, the skin on your fingers and your hand is usually thick enough that you don't need anything. But the best way to prevent this and any type of jellyfish is to always have some decent mechanical protection. So you don't need a thick uh, a wetsuit. Something as thin as a lycra suit is more than enough to prevent you, to protect you from injuries from any type of um, uh, cnidarian. So, you know, sometimes we're in the tropical waters and we feel like wearing a shorty or nothing, just a t-shirt. Well, keep in mind that you're exposed to the elements and as clear as the water may be, it is full of life, full of larvae and full of things that can eventually sting you. One thing that is important to mention about Physalia is the Australians, they say that the application of vinegar is actually contraindicated in the case of Physalia. We'll get there, bear with me. So let's jump into another group. So this group is what we would call true jellyfish. What we saw before, that is not a jellyfish, it's a hydrozoan. These, the cyphozoans, cubozoans, and antozoans, those are true jellyfish. So jellyfish are by far the nidarians that cause the most incidents. They're mostly pelagic, which means they live offshore, but not necessarily. They are the migrant form of nidarians, right? An anemone is the sedentary form. The jellyfish is the migrant form. Their size, they can vary from a few millimeters in the bell up to two meters in diameter. And the tentacles, again, from a few millimeters to up to 90 feet long or 30 meters in, in longitude. Sometimes what happens is when they get close to the beach, the waves, you know, they break them down in pieces and we get stings without necessarily seeing the animal. But it's just debris or small pieces of the animal that may still sting you. So, if there is a boogeyman on Earth, this is it. This is the sea wasp. The name is Chironex plecari and it belongs to a specific group called Cubozoans. Cubozoans, because their shape, the bell, is like a cube. It has four edges. And on each one of those edges, they have all those tentacles coming out. Now, you may think of a jellyfish as something, you know, very uh, uh, primitive and having absolutely no brain whatsoever. And that is true. They don't have any brain. They do have some neurons and some sort of, I don't know if I should call it nervous system, but they do see and they, they can, you know, interact with the environment. So this one's in particular, they actually have eyes and they have up to four pairs of eyes on, on each, uh, each one of those edges. And some of the eyes, because they have different type of eyes, they don't just see light. On some of the eyes, they have corneas and retinas and they can see objects and they can circumnavigate objects. So we need to give this fellow some credit. They're not just a jelly piece uh, that is, can cause injuries. So, this is by far the most, the most dramatic envenomation, envenomation process known by, by, by mankind. So let's see some of the, you know, the, the, the wording they used in some uh, classic literature, scientific literature. So at least 70 deaths by Chironex plecari in the northern territories of Australia over the past 100 years, 11 of them being in children. The most explosive envenomation process that is presently known to humans. So. These animals, they can kill you in as little as three minutes. 
So that is not any time to do absolutely anything. You can do CPR sometimes, just a matter of minutes, and that's it. Now, cubozoans, you have Chironex flecari, you have Chiropsalmus quadrigatus or quadrumanus. Chironex is particularly in that part of the world, right? So northern Australia, uh, all the Indo-Pacific, Indonesia, um, uh, Thailand, uh, but they don't exist anywhere beyond that. That is Chironex flecari. Chiropsalmus, there are species of cubozoans in other oceans, and some of them in our area in the Caribbean and in other parts of the world. So don't be fooled. You're not going to find that one specifically other, in any other area than this one, but there are similar species that can cause serious cases all over the place. So what are the symptoms, the clinical presentation? So extremely, and when I say extremely, I want to emphasize extremely painful lesions. If you survive them, there could be edema, vesicularization, the skin may become thinner, dermonecrosis, but usually what happens is shortly after there is respiratory depression, cardiovascular depression, and death. Now, you know, in medicine we have a lot of fancy medical terms, and one of those is we say something is pathognomonic, and when something is pathognomonic, that means that when you see it, you can make a diagnosis. So when you see skin that has this print on someone that, let me tell you, this is not a bed, right? This is a cadaver. This was a 15-year-old uh, kid. And just with those lesions, he eventually passed away. So when you see the skin and you see this print, that's all you need to make a diagnosis of BWASP or cubozoans, because that print is exactly what you see on the tentacles on the animal. Okay. So some time ago, this you know this was the presentation was described as a sudden increase in blood pressure, then a sudden decrease, and then bradycardia, which is a slow heart rate and dysrhythmias leading to death. And this was uh, thought to be due to direct vasoconstriction, cardiotoxicity, stimulation of baroreceptors, and dysautonomic reflexes. Now, now we know, thanks to the job of these two doctors, Jana Higara and Sochet, that what causes this massive and catastrophic presentation is the toxins they have, they drill a pore, little hole in the red blood cells, and this causes a massive discharge of potassium. And when we have such a massive discharge from the inside the red blood cell of potassium into the bloodstream, that messes with our cardiovascular system, with the heart rhythm, and eventually we just can't deal with it. So they identify this porin, and they know that when you expose this porin to you know, some substances, you can actually re revert this process or prevent it from happening. Now, I don't want people to be running to try to get zinc gluconate from, from this to clinical application, there may be such a what, but it, you know, it, it may be a, something promising in the future. Now, this fellow here, this is another box jellyfish. This is not the sea wasp. This is known as the Bonaire banded uh, box jellyfish. So Bonaire banded because it, is, it was first, I think, identified in Bonaire. So 50 side scenes, probably many, many more most of them being in Bonaire, but there were also some sites in, in Mexico, in St. Lucia, Honduras, and Vincent. Uh, it's a small animal, maybe no more than maybe, what, a foot or a bit, little bit longer. I always joke that maybe the, we know these are dangerous and painful because of the name, right? Samoya oboya, because when you touch them, you go like, oh boy, this hurts. Bad joke, sorry. Um, another box jellyfish, a tiny, tiny one, is the one that is responsible for Irukandji syndrome. So Irukandji syndrome is a syndrome described in the northern part of Australia. And the Irukandji are a tribe of um, Indians in that part of the world. And the Indians, they knew that there was some time of, some, uh, time of the year where they should not go into the water. And that time of the year was, you know, the summer in, 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 in the southern hemisphere. So from December to January, February, March, so that's when this tiny, tiny jellyfish that Dr. Seymour is handling there, where you can find it. And this tiny jellyfish is responsible for that syndrome. So unfortunately, some time ago, there were a few cases that caught some massive media attention. But it's important to know that with adequate supported care, uh, a moderate envenomation is usually not fatal. So the tiny thing is usually no more than five millimeters in diameter and the tentacles can be up to one meter or three feet long. So when you go into waters that are not really clean, they're maybe a little bit murky, not great for diving, 
and you get stung by something you cannot see, for them it was a, a, a big mystery why they were, that was happening. And apparently what happened is initially you have some pain, and the pain it is reported to be perhaps no more significant than a bee sting, but the problem is that that pain intensifies for several hours and for many, many hours. People that have had this injury, and this is the reason for why this got massive media attention, is you know, people that survived it, they were describing it as, you know, when you, when you, if you have ever had uh, you know, uh, kidney stones, when you're passing a stone that it reaches a point in which you cannot tolerate that pain, or on women, when you give childbirth, that it reaches a point in which that is the maximum pain you can tolerate, well, they say that that is where Irukandji starts, and it remains like that for hours. So these people were in such a degree of pain that they were absolutely sure that there was no way they were going to survive this. They were actually begging the doctor to put them out of their misery. So that is why this case has got this massive media attention, feeling of impending doom. They knew that they were not going to be able to survive it, but they did. Now, the doctor you saw on the previous slide, Dr. Jamie Seymour, he's the worldwide expert in any of this that I'm talking about, and particularly with Irukandji. If you Google his name on YouTube and look for Dr. Jamie Seymour, Irukandji, you will see some pretty interesting videos of him by accident getting exposed to Irukandji and, and what a hard time he had. So there are species that are known that can cause this. One of those is uh, Malokinji and Karukia barnesi but there are species in other parts of the world that can cause an Irukandji-like syndrome, including Hawaii and in, even in, in Florida. So let's try to wrap up Nidarians in general and what should we do to you know, prevent further envenomation and do first aids. So remember, the nematocyst is a hand grenade. So you need to be careful on how do you manipulate the hand grenade. So the first thing we have to do before we try to, you know, brush the area and wash it off, we need to try to inactivate those nematocysts that have not fired. And the way to inactivate it is by application of vinegar. That's when the urine comes at play. Some people say, oh, you need to pee on that individual. Again, probably some vinegar is cheap and expensive, clean, and not that nasty. So you can apply vinegar, and in, in most cases, vinegar does its trick in trying to make that nematocyst more stable to handle. Okay? It is not about the acidity that counteracts any, any you know, base in the venom. It's something about vinegar making it more stable to handle. Now, once you can you know, handle it, the next thing you want to do, and sorry, you see there that it says alcohol and ammonia. Yes, alcohol may have some effect, but it may not be that effective and ammonia may have an effect. Everybody recommends vinegar, and there's a good reason for why you probably don't want to use ammonia. When you use ammonia, ammonia comes in different concentrations, and some concentrations, you can actually cause some burns on the, on the people's skin. And also, when it reacts, it releases hydrogen, which you know, could be an issue too. So forget about ammonia. Use vinegar. Vinegar has the amount of acetic acid. Don't use acetic acid, because acetic acid is the concentrated form of vinegar. Vinegar is a solution that contains between two to three, maybe four or five percent of acetic acid. Don't buy acetic acid and carry it in, in, your, in your first aid kit. Just white household vinegar is all you need. The, the Australians, they don't apply this on Fisalia because they have seen that both in vivo and in vitro, when you apply vinegar to the tentacles, that causes a massive nematocyst discharge. We'll talk about that on the next slide. So once you have the nematocysts hopefully inactivated or you can handling, handle them, the next thing you will do is to try to wash them off. How should you wash them off? Well, just use water. Never use sea, uh, fresh water because fresh water has a different salinity and when you expose these unfired hand grenades to fresh water, they can actually burst. So always use seawater, that's all you need. If you have a syringe, that's great because you don't, you don't, you don't need to use anything hard to wash them off. You can use the syringe with seawater and try to flush them off and carry them out. Once you have done that and you know that you, know, you have done your best to try to one, inactivate them, two, wash them off, then you can apply heat. By applying heat, we know that these are micro injections. So with application of heat, we can be breaking down the toxin and also helping with the pain. 
the image that you see there, that is apparently in Australia, they have this, you know, all over the place, like bottles with vinegar. And they have this blue thing. So you say vinegar, blue? Well, vinegar is not blue. They just put methylene blue on the bottle so that, you know, their first aid providers and the, the, the rangers, they know when they need to replenish the vinegar bottle because they see it blue. They don't need to come close. They see it's blue, it's, it has vinegar. And the other reason, which may be an official one, they say that when you add metal in blue, you're preventing from them using it on their chips. So, another bad joke, sorry. <laughs> so, like I said before, as usual, there is controversy on how to apply vinegar. As of today, the American High Learn Association guidelines, they say that for jellyfish stings, and see the approach they have, right? So, for jellyfish stings, to inactivate venom load and prevent further envenomation, jellyfish should be liberally washed with vinegar, which like we said before, it's a solution of acetic acid, as soon as possible for at least 30 seconds. And once uh, the nematocysts are removed or deactivated, the pain should be treated with hot water immersion when possible. That is great, that's what we've been talking about, right? Unfortunately, they don't mention anything about physalia. Now, the Australians, we have to give them credit, they have a lot of experience with toxic animals. I mean, everything in Australia is trying to kill you. So they have a different approach. They say, they don't say what should you do with jellyfish. They say, how should you use vinegar? And they say, so vinegar inhibits the matter's discharge of box jellyfish, but does not provide pain relief from the venom already injected. Right, we talked about that. We know how they work. So it does nothing to the venom. It just tries to prevent those nematocysts that haven't fired from firing. Then they say in Irukanji syndrome, which is another box jelly, they say that its use is considered good first aid practice. Now then they warn, they say vinegar causes nematocysts discharge of some jellyfish, including Physalia, which over there they call it blue bottle, and is therefore recommended only for tropical areas where the box jellyfish and Irukanji stings occur. Okay? The approach is, is a little bit different. So be mindful of where you are. I don't know of any, you know, last uh, type of, of, of recommendations on which one is best, but be mindful of that. And also check, you may be seeing this seminar in a few years, check to see what, what is the current recommendation. If anything changes, we'll do our best to let everybody know. Now for box jellyfish in particular, there is a specific um, uh, anti-venom developed by the same group in Australia, the CSL, and, and then the rest is symptomatic treatment. Okay, so that is most for the ones that can potentially kill you. Now, the other groups that we thought was worth mentioning anything is the antozoans. These are the anemones and soft polyps. I mean, if you're very, very sensitive and you have very sensitive skin and you touch them, you may have some degree of contact dermatitis, but we have never heard of anything beyond that. Now, what you see on this image here that is nothing other than seawater on a magnifying glass. So we have larval stages of all different animals. I cannot tell you exactly what these are. These are probably um, um, peppers, and these are maybe, I don't know, some sort of larvae from other species. This may be either a, a, a lobster or a small a crustacean like a crab. But bottom line is, most of these larval stages of bigger creatures in their larval stage, they may have a stinging activity. So sometimes we go in the water, we don't have the right wetsuit, or we're just, you know, having enjoying the, the perfect water temperature, and we go with some t-shirts. And when we get the t-shirt, the t-shirt acts like a strain for all this uh, tiny planktonic life. And then the t-shirt rubs with our skin. And when it rubs with our skin, all these creatures that, again, some of those may not have any stinging activity in their adult stage, but they do have one in the larval stage. Then we surface and we have this itchiness and this rash and, you know, we wonder what's going on. So that's when we talk about sea bather's eruption. So sea bather's eruption is a pyritic or itchy dermatitis, and it's caused by the larval stages of cnidarians, particularly with this species here, Linuccio nicolata. So usually you see this in areas of friction. And um, yeah, so what you see here on this uh, little kit, the, um, the area of the, you know, the, sea, the, the bathing suit where it has some friction with, with the skin, that's where eventually you get the stings. And that's all we can say about the, you know, cnidarians in general. So let's talk about bristle worms. So bristle worms, beautiful animals, 
uh, as you know, you, you've probably seen them, they don't sting, they don't do anything, they, sorry, they don't sting, they don't jump at you. But, you know, sometimes with, you know, with photographers, they lean on the reef and, you know, sometimes they may touch it. So you, they can have with these little stingers you see or these barbs you see on the, on the sides of the body, uh, they, they can have some, some burning sensation. Eventually, this could be, become into small blisters. But nothing, nothing really serious. Oh, the reason I put this here is, you know, divers know that you can use cellophane tape to try to remove those uh, like hair-like structures like uh, fiberglass. So you can, you know, dry the area carefully, comb all those, uh, those um, kete, all those little hair-like structures, and then use some cellophane tape, and you can peel them off uh, quite easily. But again, nothing specific. Treatment is absolutely symptomatic. Mollusks, and we're reaching the end here, but we still have a few more minutes. So there are two mollusks that are worth mentioning anything. So one is a group of snails, known as cone snails, and, and a particular species or, or genus of octopus. So cone snails. Cone snails, they belong to a class, gastropoda. Gastro meaning the abdomen and poda meaning feet, so they walk on their abdomen. There are more than 600 species of cone snails, and of course their shape and uh, it gives them the name and makes them really easy to recognize. So if you're in tropical or subtropical waters, you find a beautiful, absolutely beautiful a cone, a beautiful snail where the shell looks like a cone. Well, I think it is safe to bet that that is a cone snail and you might want to leave it alone. So all cone snails, they are venomous, but highly, highly venomous. Among the reported common species, you see them there. And by the names, you can see that, you know, they look like a map, geographicus. They look like a tulip. They look like a cloth or, or a fabric. They look like marble, like Conus marmorius. So really, really beautiful. Sometimes we find them and we feel tempted to take them home and, well, the animal is there. And interestingly enough, these animals, they are predators. They are not vegetarian. They eat fish, they eat worms, or they eat other snails. So the size of the cone snails, they may vary depending on the species from two centimeters, so a little bit less than an inch to up to 20 centimeters or eight inches. So they're commonly found in warm and temperate shores, uh, some to colder waters like Southern Africa and California. They are voracious predators and they live partially buried in the sand like what we can see there. So as you can see, the animal is buried under the sand and they have two structures that they can project to the surface. So one is the proboscis, that is, let's say, their mouth, right? And the other one is a siphon. This is, let's say, their nose. This is what they use to pump water into their gills to breathe. But this one is both the mouth and some nose. So when the animal uh, can smell the prey, they project this and they, let's say, they give the little fish a big kiss and they actually use a small dart and they eat the fish. So here on this video, hopefully,